Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Texas McCombs Homecoming. It's so nice to see you again. I, I hope you were able to attend some of our sessions yesterday. They were really great and we'll continue to have sessions through tomorrow. So I hope to see you there as well. But today I'm so happy to be able to introduce Professor, Professor Tricia Moravec. She's going to speak to us today about social media and the difficulty of combating misinformation. So Dr. Moravec is an assistant professor in the Department of Information Risk and Operations Management here at the McComb School. And she received her PhD from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, where she also received the Outstanding Doctoral Student Award, which is awarded by the program office to one graduating doctoral student across all of the departments. She has done extensive research, which has been published in Information Systems Research, the Journal of Management Information Systems, and MIS Quarterly. Plus, her research has been covered by Forbes, Fox Business, KXAN, KUT, as well as other news organizations with over 162 million unique views. Trisha, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Christine. And Thank you to everyone here that wants to hear about this, this work. I'm so excited to talk about it. So excited to be part of McCombs Homecoming in some version. And so please, as I'm going through this, please, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. As you have questions come up, I'm happy to take them throughout the presentation, but I'm also to have, I'm happy to take them at the end as well. So always happy for interruptions though. And so, as Christine said, I'm here to talk about social media and the difficulty of combating misinformation. And so this is what I've studied for the past four years now is social media and really how misinformation has become more of an issue in the past four or five years and how social media has really contributed to that. And so my first question for everybody is, do you use social media? I can't see your hands. I can't see your faces, but I'm assuming most of you use at least one of these. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn. I know as a business school, we're pretty big on that. So it's likely you use some type of social media. And when we use social media, that means that there's going to be less of an oversight in or editorial review of the material that we're going to see because we're seeing information that's just shared by other people. And so that leads us to this issue of having more misinformation being shown to us just by virtue of us being on social media. And so what is misinformation? Misinformation is information that is verifiably false and intending to mislead. There's different terms that we can talk about here, disinformation and misinformation and fake news. Fake news and misinformation pretty much very similar misinformation and disinformation are going to be more of the academic terms that we're going to use to describe this where disinformation has an intention to mislead. There is malicious intent behind it. Misinformation can be accidental misinformation as well. And so this is an example of some misinformation that came up around the 2016 election. And the thing that I find very interesting about this specific example is that these statistics are all incorrect. They're all being shown in a way that is incorrectly bringing you to some other belief pattern than what's actually true. But we can see on this slide that we have this source, the Crime Statistics Bureau of San Francisco. This doesn't exist. This source isn't even real. And so we came into this issue on social media where people got quite adept at designing misinformation that actually looks realistic and looks like it has sources backing it up. And so that started to become a problem in 2016 and it has really just taken off since then. And so some misinformation we've continued to see is that, you know, COVID-19 is a hoax and 5G is the real killer. There's no scientific information backing this up. Again, Recently, what we've been seeing is some misinformation about the danger of face masks, which again, there's no evidence backing it up. And so we have to be careful about what we see online, especially when we have some urge to believe it 
because it might be interesting or align with our beliefs. And so just in a lighter example, a few weeks ago, this piece of misinformation came out saying Disney is moving to Texas. And unfortunately, Disney is not moving to Texas as much as we would probably all appreciate that. And so the thing is, some of these examples were, you know, kind of funny. A lot of them have to do with the politics of the time or some of these topics that are really of interest. But what we've actually seen is that these different pieces of misinformation that have come out can actually influence the stock market. They can influence financial markets. And this becomes far more problematic than just individual pieces of misinformation. And so hopefully at this point, we can all recognize that misinformation exists. It, is, it exists very much on social media. But then you might be saying, yeah, but why is it bad? Other than the fact that people are believing something that's not true, why is it bad? And one of the things I'm going to mention here is that it divides us. And so as a society, we've continued to move more and like further and further apart from the left and the right. And this misinformation leads to more extreme beliefs, which leads to this increase in polarization. And so as a society, this isn't very beneficial for us. And so in social media, when we're also in our echo chambers, where we're seeing information from our friends and family and associates who believe similar things that we do, this just continues to confirm our beliefs and helps us kind of get stuck at those further ends rather than actually coming together. And so misinformation exists beyond just news, marketing has some issues with misinformation where they say this is going to make you grow big and strong when there's no evidence for that either. And so marketing has some issues of misinformation finance, as we saw in an earlier slide, some pieces of information can come out on Twitter and then influence a certain stock. We see that with Tesla as Elon Musk tweets. We see that in a number of different scenarios where just one small tweet from someone influential can very much influence the markets. We see it in reviews. I do encourage all of you to be very careful when you are looking at reviews online because not all reviews are true. And there is some evidence that a lot of the reviews we see on Amazon, a lot of the reviews we see online are actually false or they're created by people who haven't actually used the product. And so just be careful about that. And then we also have health misinformation. And this was a topic of concern before this past year, but now with COVID and this pandemic, we've actually seen an increase in health misinformation where we actually have clear demonstrable uh, consequences of health information and people being sick. But there is a difference between kind of the news we get on social media and the misinformation we get on social media and what would happen if we get this elsewhere, like on a review site or at an actual news organization. And that's going to be our mindset. And what I want to really focus on here is that when we're on social media, we tend to be in this mindset where we're really just passively pursuing entertainment. We're not even actively pursuing entertainment. Oftentimes, we're trying to avoid doing something else that we don't want to do. And we're not actively seeking information on some specific topic. And so what this looks like is you can have some post about someone's Thanksgiving, about someone's baby, about someone going on some beautiful adventure, and then right next to that can be a political post. And so you're not in a mindset of actively engaging with that content, and so you can be duped. Whereas if you actually go to a news site, to a news organization with the intention of consuming news, yes, you're going to get news that is of the lean, of the source that you're looking at, but at least you are in this task goal oriented mindset where you're trying to actively engage with the content. And so this is one reason why social media is a difficult environment for us to consume potentially important information. And so what can we do about that? One is we can filter misinformation using algorithms. And this can be somewhat effective but overall, we still have issues with kind of manipulated images. 
we have issues with manipulated video, we have issues with memes, especially just the way that memes work, having some text over an image makes it really difficult for AI to actually figure out what that text is and determine whether it's misinformation or not. And so, yes, we're getting better at detecting misinformation with algorithms, but we still have difficulty and organic content on social media. What this means is what random people are posting. That's also a lot harder for us to manage as it is, you know, just created and then shown. And so, you know, algorithms, right, making progress, but humans can filter too, right? We can use some decision tree processes. We can think critically. We can look at different news sites and gather pieces of information from a variety of sources. But the problem is that we are not really motivated to do that on social media. As I've said, we are in this hedonic mindset and we're also really not very good at it. And so in one of my studies, we looked at how effective some participants were at detecting misinformation. And unfortunately, only 17 percent of them were better than 50 percent at detecting misinformation and then an additional six percent or right at 50 percent so overall we're looking at less than 25 percent of people being able to detect misinformation better than a flip of a coin so that's not ideal right that's not great and people are getting better over time but we still have these issues that are leading toward our you know, constant struggle with misinformation. And so one of these is the way that we think. And so the way that we think can typically be described as two different types of cognition, two different processes. And so we can call these system one and system two or type one and type two thinking. And how this works is that generally as you go about your day, as you walk down a street, do whatever you do in the morning, your system one cognition is automatically managing every interaction you have. It's involuntary, it's continuous. We really do not have to put any effort in to our system one thinking. It is our gut level cognition that really just helps us manage any interaction with our day around us. System two, however, this can come second where system one always occurs first, it is our constant processing. But system two, this is where we think critically. This is deliberate, it's consciously invoked. If you're sitting here actively trying to engage in this presentation and think about this information, then you're using system two. And as we know from being in school at McCombs previously, or you know, having Zoom meetings, which you're probably doing now, it's very hard to maintain system two critical thinking for a long period of time. And so we end up being these cognitive misers where we use this sparingly and we have a limited capacity. And so if we're not careful about the way we're thinking, we can accidentally pretty easily slip back into our system one gut level cognition. And so you can see that with system one, just our automatic reaction to everything, system two, more of our critical thinking, but it's effortful. And so what ends up happening for us is that when we're on social media, especially in this hedonic mindset, we're constantly just system one involuntarily reacting to everything we see. And what happens is that when we have this confirmation bias or this tendency to overvalue information that aligns with our beliefs, this tendency to believe information that we already believe to be true, this is just made worse when we're in system one and in this hedonic mindset. And so with confirmation bias, we have some beliefs and anything that we see that aligns with these beliefs, we just say, yep, that checks out. I believe that evidence. If we see something that doesn't align with our beliefs, if we don't wanna think critically about it, we just ignore it. And this is well known, this is common. And so to kind of understand how confirmation bias works on social media, I used EEG or electroencephalography to measure our cognition when we're on social media and we're presented with misinformation. And so what I found is that we think about what we like. And so in this study, showing people different headlines of various political beliefs and then matching these headlines with the participants belief system, what we see is that 
people think more about information that aligns with their beliefs and they essentially ignore information that doesn't align with their beliefs. And that's not ideal when we're talking about a society that's moving further apart politically and we're talking about issues with misinformation. Because now if we see something that aligns with our beliefs on social media, we just kind of say, yeah, that looks great. That's awesome. And then if we see something that doesn't align with our beliefs, whether it's true or not, we'll just discard that piece of information and we won't actively think about it or engage with it. And so that's, that's really not ideal. And so what this shows is just that when we are seeing information that aligns with our beliefs, we think. So this blue means that we're thinking actively. This yellow green here means that we're not thinking. And what we see is that over a period of four seconds, it's highly significant difference in the way that we think about this information, whether it aligns or doesn't. And so this is evidence that confirmation bias on social media is very strong and very influential in the way we consume information. And so one thing we can do about that though, is create cognitive dissonance. Where cognitive dissonance means that you have some piece of information that you know to be true, and then you're given some other piece of information that contradicts that. And so what happens here is either this information you know that's true is not actually true, or this new piece of information you got is not true. And so if this second piece of information is compelling enough, we can actually get you to kind of critically consider this first piece of evidence that you were so sure about. And so what Facebook had done in 2017 was displayed this disputed by third party fact checkers flag. And although not only my research, but other research has said this flag was not very effective, when this study was run, we didn't know that. And so we're testing that. And what that looked like was that we had some Facebook style posts, and then we had Facebook style posts with this disputed by third party fact checkers flag. And so we're comparing the difference, not only in people's cognition when they see information that aligns with their beliefs and then doesn't align, but now we're also comparing their cognition when they see headlines that are flagged and headlines that are not flagged. And so the idea is that some type of flag that tells you this is disputed or this is false information will create some cognitive dissonance when people want to believe it is true and help them more critically consider that information. And so what we found is that the flag did make us think, which is great. So when we're comparing cognitive activity within subject between flag headlines that align with beliefs and those that aren't flagged and aren't aligned, people do think more critically. But what we also saw was that we didn't see any change in belief in the headline. And so although people thought more, it wasn't enough to actually change their belief we know in hindsight now that this disputed by third party fact checker flag, the phrasing itself is pretty poor in trying to help people to believe something else because disputed automatically makes people think that there's difference of opinions there. When what this flag was actually aiming to say was, this has been determined to be misinformation. And so what we saw here is that this flag made people think, but it didn't actually change belief. But the beauty of this is that it shows that there could be some type of intervention that is effective in reducing belief because we do see that some type of intervention like this did make people think more. And so what do we do about that? Create warning labels based on theory. Create these warning labels that can be much stronger. And so if you remember the discussion earlier on system one and system two cognition, or system one is our automatic gut level reaction to everything around us, and system two is our critical thinking, what I want you to recognize is that a stop sign, just by nature, is something that very much appeals to our system one. Because anyone who drives or, you know, even walks on streets and sees cars stop, we have this automatic response to stop at a stop sign. It's not like you see a stop sign and then you think to yourself, hmm, a stop sign, I should stop. No, you see a stop sign and your foot just goes to the brake and you just start stopping. And so we have a very much an automatic response to that. And so this is what we were trying to do with this icon here, was to create a much stronger gut level response to say, hold it, don't just believe this right away. 
And then switching the text to say declared fake by third party fact checkers. This is stronger language that ideally creates enough of cognitive dissonance that people are kind of nudged into that system to critical thinking. And so what we found is that having this combination of this system one and system two aspects to this intervention was highly effective. And it was more effective than any other intervention that we tried, even when people were trained on it and they weren't trained on this. So imagine this flag just showed up in your newsfeed. You had no idea what was going on, but it just popped up. This was still more effective than any of the other flags, even when people had been notified of what the flag meant. So from the prior research that said, we didn't see a change in beliefs with that original flag, but people thought about it. We moved into this where we said, okay, well, let's design this based on theory and see what happens. And what we can see is that something like this is very effective in reducing people's belief in misinformation. And so that is one very positive aspect of this research. What we've also seen is that source ratings, which would be rating a source instead of rating a headline. And this means that it can be applied as soon as a, an article is published rather than waiting for some article to be fact checked. Because as long as the source has a rating, you can always apply this source rating. We find that these work, but they don't work quite as strongly as the article level interventions. And there is always some concern about who's doing the rating. But one of the problems with these is that these different types of interventions, what happens is they end up leading to an increased belief in non-flagged headlines or headlines without an intervention. Because what people are assuming is that if a flag hasn't been applied, that means it's true, or that means it's good quality news, when it could just not be fact-checked yet. And so what Penny Cook and his group has done is they called this the implied truth effect, where you believe headlines more when they are not flagged if you've been introduced to this flag. And so this can be harmful when a flag may be applied late because it's hard to actually fact-check really quickly when we have so much information constantly being created. And if flags are if we have difficulty applying that to videos, images, or memes, so as we've said earlier, with algorithms checking, it can be difficult to kind of assess the quality of videos, images, and memes. So if we can't apply a flag quickly, then people are just going to believe it more as long as they know that flogging exists. So that's not ideal. But what we've seen is that if you can ask someone how truthful is this story? And then asking them for their personal knowledge. I have personal knowledge and it's true. I have personal knowledge and it's false, or I don't have personal knowledge, but it seems like it's true or it seems like it's false. And I cannot tell. If you ask people this, they actually think so much more about not only this headline that it's on, but the ones that we see afterward. So to this question, to stop the implied truth effect, could we not have a green light icon and say it is verified by third party fact checkers on publication? That could be an interesting idea. The issue is going to be holding off on publishing any piece of information until we can green light it. And so I think that could have some effectiveness as long as we can put in that stop gap where nothing is published without being green lighted. So, I mean, that's going to be the, the main issue here is that with the speed that everything is being published and created, I think it's just going to be almost impossible to check everything before then. And then the other point to that is any user generated content, we won't be able to really apply this check on it. And so people will still be able to post whatever they want. And then if it's not fact checked in time, we still have that same issue of the implied truth. And that's a good question. And so anyway, so to get past this though, is to try to get people to think more about these headlines that aren't flagged yet. And so this was a really exciting project for me because what we see is that we have some control before where we let people see just normal Facebook's normal headlines. 
And then we applied this rating. And then we measured their belief and their cognition between these different cases of the control before the rating headline and then the control after where these two, the rating and the control after were intermixed randomly. So they'd see one rating, a control, another control, a rating, just completely randomly intermixed. And so the intention here is that there's this thing called autobiographical episodic memory retrieval, which is really just saying you're thinking about your own experiences and retrieving memories about those experiences. And what happens is if we can use this autobiographical episodic memory retrieval to actually create analytical thinking or system two critical thinking, then the ideal case would have people recognizing they do lack knowledge around this topic and then eventually reduce the belief. And so the idea here is that fortunately, since this isn't just an intervention that applies to only the article that it's on, it may have some influence and some spillover effect to the headlines that don't have this rating afterward. And so what we saw is that asking users to rate increased critical thinking. And especially in an executive function working memory area, which is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and then the medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in decision-making and memory retrieval. And so when we talk about the medial prefrontal cortex, this was especially seen between the control before and the rating headline and control afterward. So both of these together, the rating headline and the control were very similar compared to the control. And so we saw that between these two different groups of headlines, we saw increased medial prefrontal cortex activation, which means that there's increased decision-making, increased memory retrieval. You can kind of think about this as participants worked to actively retrieve memories and make decisions. So that's awesome. And then with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex results, where we saw these was especially between the control before and the control after, which this is what gets me super excited because of this issue with the implied truth effect is that what we saw here is between the control before, there was actually a difference in behavior between the control before and the control after. But instead of being a difference where they believe the control more, we actually saw an increase in cognitive activation and a decrease in belief. And so what we see is that there's an increase in executive function, working memory conflict resolution, which is kind of an amplification of relevant autobiographical information and a suppression of irrelevant information. And so the beauty of this is that this intervention did get people to believe misinformation less, but not only on the headlines with the intervention, but in all the other headlines afterward. And so this has completely kind of taken care of the implied truth effect, but we still don't know exactly how long this effect would last, how often you need to see this type of an intervention of asking of them asking you to rate. We don't know how often you need to see that to kind of be triggered back into this critical thinking mindset. And so the big thing here is that once you have this headline with this question shown to you, there's a big difference in the way that you think about these two controls. And to me, that was just such an interesting and such a fun result to find. And so what do we end up knowing in the end? Confirmation bias is still a problem. People still wanna believe information that aligns with their beliefs. And that's gonna be hard to counteract, but we do have ways to manage that now. We do have some of these ideas that actually can be very effective. Producing ratings as we're doing here, where people are actually producing ratings themselves can actually drive attention. And the thing is, we don't actually wanna use these ratings to create some article level rating of how quality this is, because what we've already seen in other prior research that I've done is that people believe experts more. People are very, you know, they're cautious on believing something coming from different users, but they believe experts. So the funniest part of this is that producing ratings can drive attention, but we don't really want to use these ratings. But the production of it themselves is what's very important. And so these mindfulness nudges, that's what we can call them. They're mindfulness nudges, essentially. They can be super effective when we're using this self-reflection piece. And so globally, misinformation is still a problem. Health misinformation, every time there's an election in most countries at this point, there's an issue with misinformation. 
whether it's on WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, whichever social media site we're going to go with, there's a problem with misinformation. And so this wasn't a 2016 problem. This is a continuing problem for the U.S. and for the rest of the world. Social media has some responsibility to help with this issue, but Facebook previously was absolutely loath to take responsibility and kind of work to help with this issue. But now they've started to do more about limiting spread, highlighting accurate information. They still don't do very much. But Twitter, as we've seen, has actually tried to actively label and remove false content when they can verify that it's false and remove claims that may lead to voter suppression. And so Twitter is taking more of an action, whether you agree with what they're doing or not. I think the big thing is taking responsibility and trying to figure out what they can do to help is very important. And so both of these are enhancing their machine learning capabilities and blocking or labeling political ads. And so there's more they can do, but at least at this point, they're taking some responsibility, but it's been a long road to get to that level of taking responsibility. And so now my final thing to say to you is what can you do? And what I recommend is use news sites and use a variety of different news sites with different political leanings. Try and stretch yourself to consume news that comes from a news site that is the opposite end of what you normally watch or read. And so if you're, and if you typically use one of these more politically aligned news sites, try and see what the other political alignment is doing. If you try and stick with more neutral news sites, then I'd say stick with those neutral news sites, but it can be interesting to go toward the other side and read what they're, what they're writing about. And I think that's really good for us to understand each other and to understand this space better. So try and use news sites. Try not to get your news on social media, any type of social media. What else? Actually, like reading a newspaper or a magazine, something that has news in it, that is going to trigger you to be in more of a utilitarian mindset because you're just using this paper. You're more actively engaged in what you're doing. And so that can be a good way to help yourself avoid misinformation as well. Finally, delete and deactivate your social media accounts. Just kidding, kind of. I mean, I've deactivated my Facebook because I do think that it can be harmful in such a variety of ways, but especially with misinformation and echo chambers. But you have to do what's right for you. But we know that there are certain issues with social media sites in misinformation management and in a variety of other health consequences. So it's never a bad idea to take a break, even just for a little bit. So I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. If you do have more questions, please ask them in the chat. And if you have any ideas for how we should manage this, also please feel free to share that. Thank you so much, Tricia. Um, it's been so informative for me hearing your presentation today. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of perhaps deactivating my Facebook account. We'll see. I don't, I don't really look at it, so I don't know if I really need to. But it looks like we have a few questions coming in. Yeah. So do I encourage readers on Facebook to flag misinformation or fake news? I do, right? Because that's just giving more information to people who might be able to make some decision about it. You're not going to be the you know end all decision so you may as well have your voice heard though and i think that's always good is to make sure that your voice is being heard so definitely report it if you truly think something is misinformation i think that's very valuable anything else Any more questions for Trisha before we wrap it up? We have experienced misinformation coming from elected officials. And I think, and this question asks, what do I make of that? I think it's problematic, of course. I think that the, that we need 
people in power to report truthful information. And so it's uncomfortable for us to see interventions taken that tries to help encourage people to share information that's verifiable, but it's very difficult to watch someone who's able to reach so many people, no matter if it's a local level or state level or, you know, the U.S. level, whichever one it is, it's just hard to see someone who has a very broad audience sharing information that they likely know isn't true. And so in this case, we still need to manage that. I don't think anyone in our society should just get carte blanche to share misinformation because that's just irresponsible. Thank you for all these questions, Judy. Well, Trisha, thank you so much. I, I so enjoyed your presentation today and it's it's been so thought provoking and I'm sure that everyone else who was with us today also enjoyed it. And we are gonna make the recording available to the rest of our attendees. So um, I'm sure we might have a few questions and um, we'll, we'll share those with you later too. Yeah, but, and but thank you again. Thank you. Everyone's free to reach out to me, um, Patricia Morbeck at macombs.utexas.edu. So feel free to reach out and just recognize that misinformation is not a partisan issue. This isn't partisan. This is an issue for all of us, no matter what we believe. We want everyone to be able to access true information reliably. And so please don't ever mistake this issue for something that we should disagree about.